meeting of the Floyd County Board of Education. Let the record reflect that I'm Linda Gearhart, the board chair and president. I'm doing a roll call for the other board members to establish their presence. Keith Smallwood. Here. Steve Sloan. Yes. William Newsom. Present. Chandra Varia. Let the record reflect that a quorum of the board members are present to conduct this meeting, which I am now calling to order. We will re review our focus areas first. They are safety and health of students and staff, remain fiscally solvent, attendance of 94%, social, emotional well-being of all students and staff, post-secondary readiness, proficiency in all academic areas, ACT of scores of 19.5. Let me remind you that if you want to speak to sign the clipboard, and the board reserves the right to limit the amount of uh, time to five minutes, depending, and that depends, of course, on how many speak. We may have to limit it to less. So if you haven't signed the clipboard, please do so. At this time, let's say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, let's have a moment of individual silent reflection as to why we are here. And of course, we, we're thinking about the children. Thank you. Let's also remember those, are, like I said before, our neighbors in Tennessee who have had a terrible, terrible time the northeast uh, states that are having a terrible time with the storms. And let's think of our troops and our U.S. citizens that are in Afghanistan. And let's pray for their safety. Thank you. The adoption of the agenda. Do we have any changes, Ms. Shepard? Okay. No, there are no changes. Okay. I'd entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. Dr. Varia. Dr. Varia made the motion. Second. I'll second. Second. Steve. Yes. And we'll do a roll call. Keith Smallwood. Yes. Steve Sloan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> William Newsom. Yes. Chandra Varia, and the chair votes yes. The motion carries. Do we have spotlight on staff and student community achievements? Did I turn it off? Okay. I thought maybe I turned it off there. Tonight we want to recognize one of our community champions, and I have a, a list of some amazing things that they have done for our students and our staff and our communities. But before these three hospitals combined under the uh, umbrella of ARH, individually they always said yes, whether it was Highlands, St. Joe's, or McDowell. I don't think I ever called on any of them that they didn't say, yes, we'll help. Yes, we can do this. We'll be here. 
They've come into our classrooms. They've been at our opening day events. They generally are true community partners. And then they joined and now it's an even stronger force. The three Floyd County ARH hospitals will be providing telemedicine for students, faculty, and staff of John M. Stumbo Elementary, May Valley Elementary, Adams Middle, Betsy Lane High, Prestonsburg High, and the Renaissance Learning Center in this upcoming school year. Patients will be provided care by doctors from three Floyd County hospitals without having to leave the school. Telemedicine in schools not only improves access to care, but it promotes learning because it helps allow our students to stay in school for non-contagious illnesses. It can help improve attendance, reduce missed work time for parents, and it prevents the reduction in funding from state resources. Appalachian Regional Healthcare has also partnered with Floyd County Schools to provide COVID vaccine clinics at all open house events at middle and high school for anyone 12 plus. I believe they have been, they're gonna cover 17 different open house events. And so far uh, to this point, approximately 50 people have been vaccinated. Recently, ARH Neurology made concussion education sessions available to all of our middle and high school coaches in Floyd County Schools, stressing the importance of seeking medical attention for students, when to return to play, and what to expect during recovery. The three ARH hospitals have also provided $20,000 to purchase the new scoreboard for Prestonsburg High School. And throughout the school year, ARH hopes to continue to provide mentorship opportunities to students, scrubs camps, ARH bowl games, awareness events at school events, additional sponsorships, health education in classes, and support for teachers at every possible opportunity. And that's why tonight we wanted to recognize a true community champion in our three ARH hospitals and I would like to ask the CEOs, uh, Kathy Stumbo, Russ Barker, and Tim Hatfield, if you will come forward, please. I would like all the board members to please come and take a picture. And I also meant to, and didn't have it down, recognize Dr. Stumbo. He is our Chief Regional Medical Officer. At this time, we have community com comments to the Board of Education. Are there any students that would like to make comments? Parents, PTA, PTO. I'm assuming we've got parents here. So, Kevin Spurlock.
appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, first off, uh, Ms. Shepard, uh, board members, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. I want to congratulate Ms. Shepard on being named superintendent. She is more deserving than the superintendent's chair than anybody we've recently had. She works hard and she loves our kids. I know that firsthand. She's taught my children and I know how much she loves our kids. So I want to congratulate the board and make them a very quick uh, super pick for our county and our kids. Secondly, I'm here tonight as, as a now a former educator, a grandfather, a concerned citizen, and as a registered Floyd County taxpayer and voter. Just as I could get up here and give you all sorts of data telling you how masks don't work, someone else could get up here and show the same type of data that says they do. And that's daily enough for us all on Facebook and Twitter, so I won't waste uh, the board's time with that. I'm here to ask that common sense be used. As a recent teacher, I saw firsthand how high school teenagers struggled to wear a mask daily. As a teacher, I can attest to how hard it was for adults to do this as well, including myself. I spoke to several of my colleagues who shared the same concern with children they taught in grades K through 8. My question tonight is if all these people of different ages and different grades struggle with it, how can small children ages two through five be expected to not only do this all day, but also to be trying to learn academically, socially, and emotionally. Common sense, and this is damn near impossible. My grandson's mother could most likely get a medical waiver, but how would that make him feel among his peers who had to wear it? What about the other kids who needed a waiver but couldn't get one for whatever reason? Who are their voices? I say you are, and I am, when it comes to their school and their education. Governor Bashir cowardly took the way out today by rescinding his mask mandate because the court felt it unlawful and not within his authority to do so. But before this, he had his puppets at the Kentucky Department of Education pass the mandate for the entire school year, and now he hides behind them. I ask the Floyd County Board of Education to be a leader and not a puppet. I ask them to challenge this mandate with all of its power on behalf of our kids. I bet all I own that the majority of Floyd County will support you in this endeavor. Be the voice we need you to be. Be the voice our children need you to be. For once, send a message to Frankfurt that they don't control us and that politics will not decide what is best for our students. Just a couple of years ago, it was decided to call off school and take bus loads of teachers to Frankfurt to fight for their pensions. And I'm okay with that because I was a teacher too. But today, we need you to fight the same fight on behalf of our kids. Challenge this mandate. I don't ask for a mask to be done away with, but I ask it to be the parent's choice. It's their children that they pay taxes to their schools allow kids to go to school without masks. My three-year-old grandson was accepted to Head Start early because he has challenges. There is no earthly way that he can wear a mask every day for every hour of school. No way at all. And to ask him to do so is unfair to him. We need you to step up for kids like this who need the services, who need the resources of our schools. We need you to step up for our children. God bless our children. God bless our teachers, our administrators, all other staff, and also our parents this school year. Thank you. good at this as my dad is, but I'll try. <laughs> my name is Savannah King. I'm the mother of a three-year-old. Sorry, little boy. Whose name is Axel. Axel has a hard time communicating. Over the past year, 
We as parents have worked every day with Axel to get him Head Start ready. We enrolled him in the program First Steps. He met with his speech therapist two to three days a week. We put him in daycare full time to get him used to interacting with other children his age. We worked every day trying to get him to overcome his sensory issues. And we even had tubes put in his ears so he could, so he could stop getting water in them and understand what we were teaching and saying to him. As a parent, we were excited to hear that Axel had, had received a spot in Head Start and would be going to Prestonsburg Elementary this upcoming school year. Shortly after, the governor declared his 270-day mask mandate for children over the age of two. Although the Supreme Court made him rescind that mandate, I'm still aware of, Kentu of the Kentucky Department of Education's mask requirement that is still in place. Axel doesn't learn like other children. Axel is a very visual learner. He has to see. He has to hear. He has to be very hands-on for him to grasp what you are trying to teach him. Axel cannot learn in a mask. He simply just doesn't understand. We as parents have chose to unenroll Axel from Head Start. Thank you. Because we know that even though he has worked very hard to be ready, he sadly isn't because of a mask. I'm not here to bombard you with the scientific data of how dangerous masks can be for our developing children. I'm not here to make your job any more tough than it needs to be. I'm here as a mother who desperately wants her kid to attend Head Start, but knows he physically and emotionally can't because of the mask mandate. I'm asking you to give Floyd County Schools a chance to be known. As a school system, who will stand up and be a voice for their students, especially the ones who don't have a voice of their own yet. I'm here as a mother because I want to give Floyd County Schools a chance to help my child grow as an individual. I'm here as a mother so I can look in my child's eyes and say I tried to advocate for his rights. And my rights as a parent to choose what is best for my child. I'm here as a mother because I know what, what is best for my child. I know he needs, I know what he needs and how he learns best. I'm here as a mother because I know that as a parent, I have the God-given right to say what I think is best for my child. I'm here as a mother and for all the mothers to say that it should be our choice whether we mask our children or not. I'm here as a mother pleading and praying that you will be brave enough to stand up for my child and all the children within your school system and challenge the KDE's mask requirement. I voted you in because I had hope that when it came down to it, when it really came down to the children, whatever the situation may be, that you would be the ones brave enough to take a stand and fight for our children. I know your job has been tough this past year. I pray for peace of mind for all of you. I hope you will take my words into consideration and stand up to the nonsense. 
that the KDE has put in place on our children. Don't let Axel's hard work go to waste. Thank you. Amber Burchett. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Am I close enough? Okay. Good afternoon and thank you for allowing me the time to speak. Um, I have notes. I have a lot of data, statistics, kind of like them. I don't really want to bore you with all that. I'm sure you know. So I'm going to skip around a little bit and kind of just speak from the heart. Um, like I said, my name is Amber Burchett. I'm the mother of a student at Adams Middle School. <clears throat> I come before you today to have my voice and frankly the voice of many others heard. I am blessed to be a stay at home mother and I have the time to come nonsensically plead with our elected officials to allow myself and other parents the sole decision making over our children's health. So I guess the first question I want to pose to you is what are the metrics? What are the metrics you are using to make the decision to have my child wear a piece of cloth for seven hours a day? What are the metrics you are using to decide to close schools and deny my child of a quality education and a normal childhood? Have you set the unrealistic standard of zero COVID? Is that the number we need to be at before children can be children again? If your answer is no, then what is it? What is your end game? There is no evidence that the masking of kids is effective or for that matter, necessary. The CDC statistics on age as of August 18th, 2021, show that a grand total of people in the United States who have died under the age of 18 involving COVID, not just of COVID, but involving, that is the CDC's wording, not mine. So ages zero to 17, which is a cohort of 73 million Americans, the grand total is 361. And although each of those are devastating, you cannot say that we are seeing a large uptick in the death of children. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment, it is 2008. A kid at the school has the flu. That kid transmits the flu to my child both parents responsibly keep their child at home. But did you shut down the schools? No, of course you didn't because that would be silly. Although in 2008, we had an outbreak of the swine flu. That particular epidemic was far more deadly for kids. That flu resulted in about 1,282 deaths in kids. Not one school closed its doors for weeks on end. Not one child was required to wear a mask. So is this truly for the kids now? And if so, does that mean that you hated kids then? Did their lives not matter that year? Of course not, of course that's not what it means. It meant that we realized that there was an implicit amount of risk that comes with living. And so we continued living. It also indicates that this is probably not about the kids at all. I will also note that if in 2008, I had sent my baby to school with a ridiculous cloth mask and told you that under no circumstances is she to take that off, you would have investigated me for Munchausen syndrome by proxy. You would have declared that it is cruel for me to mask my child to that extent because of my unreasonable fears. And you probably would have insisted that there was no way teachers could be expected to enforce such an asinine rule. And you would have been right. All we are asking is to go back to a time when we were not ruled by fear and we show a touch of common sense. So now I ask, are we doing this for the teachers? They should have all been vaccinated by now or at least had the opportunity to be vaccinated. If they don't wanna get vaccinated, then they can wear an N95. That's on them. They have obviously weighed the risk reward of this situation as most adults have and have made their decision. I am in no way encouraging or discouraging anyone to get a vaccine. That is a personal choice. I am, however, saying that if you have decided that you are okay with the risk of not taking the vaccine, then it is not my child's responsibility to protect you from the consequences of that decision. 
These decisions are not rooted in data linked to the danger for children. We all know the danger for children is exorbitantly low and the data does not exist. You are trying to scare the hell out of parents and the stats do not bear it out. I do not think that you are bad people. I truly don't. I think that you all really care about our children. And I think deep down when you look at a two-year-old with a dirty mask on that you know that it's wrong and you know that it's cruel. I could go on and on with stats and the dangers of masking children and the damage it does, but I don't need those stats because I am her mother. I know, and any of you that are parents know, that in your gut you know this is wrong. Now's the time, you have a moment, you can show courage and you can put an end to this madness. And you can be the leader of the state for Kentucky kids that says enough is enough. It ends in Floyd County. Thank you. Brenda, are you speaking for, for FCEA? Are you speaking for Brenda? Good evening, and thank you, Ms. Shepard and board members for the opportunity to speak on behalf of FCEA. What a wonderful day it's been to be part of Floyd County Schools. Thank you, Ms. Shepard, our board members, and our central office team and technology team for a fabulous open day, opening day program. I love to see our kids be part of this event. Great job to the Floyd Central JROTC, Ms. Cheyenne Keithley from Betsy Lane, and Seth and Xander Dingus from Prestonburg Elementary. Now I know Seth and Xander, and they are such a joy to teach. And I wanted to share a short update from FCEA. One of the things we're working on is with our um, Frisky Centers in the high schools to buy hygiene items for our students that may need that. You know, we're so glad that the board is providing basic supplies and we were trying to think of something else that we could do for students that might need that. Uh, we've also established a website and a Facebook page for FCEA to share information and updates. And KEA offers a lot of professional learning opportunities to its members for free. One of the great programs is called Savvy, and if they have student loans, they can, they can pretty much save thousands of dollars. Also, if their child has student loans, they can save as well with that program. So it's a great value for your dues. I want to thank the board. I don't know if I did last time because I've, I've had two hip surgeries this summer. <laughs> But um, I want to thank you for raising the pay for all our employees across the board. It's just amazing. I know that Angela had asked, that for, asked for that for a long time. Um, just thank you for everyone that made that happen. And now we have the opportunity to get a $1,500 stipend um, and get better for kids with social emotional learning with Dr. Sweeney. And that was a great training today. I saw over 400 of our employees participated in the training with Dr. Sweeney. And as the FCA president, I want to celebrate the wonderful work our people do every day in Floyd County. And I'm just a call, text, or email away. If I can help anyone in any way, I will do it. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Brad. Okay, thank you for uh, speaking and thank you, Mr. Spurlock, for your kind words. Uh, like you said, we have as many uh, families on both sides of this debate. So uh, we know there's lots, as you said. And although the governor rescinded the mask mandate of the 30 days today, we still do have the Kentucky Board of Education's emergency regulation of masking, which is 270 days. As we currently stand today as well, uh, we cannot jeopardize certificates of educators by not following that regulation by the Kentucky, uh, the state uh, school board. And so my recommendation to our board is for us to follow the emergency regulation as we are today to help us get back to in-person learning.
that as of now, that is the law for us to follow the uh, regulations of the Kentucky School Board Association. And so that the, the Kentucky School Board's emergency regulation that is still in place. But it's not law. That's a, that's a recommendation. It's a regulation. It's not law. It's a regulation. You're correct. Have anybody that wants to speak on SBDM council classified employees other certified employees can we know before I leave that when they were all socializing before the camera went on their masks were off or being worn improperly so just so everybody knows you're being played you are being played and plus you can Principals Association, members of the Board of Education. Ms. Shepard, did, did you want to make a statement? Yeah, I wanted to uh, just thank Dr. Chandra Varia for her donation of, for the renovations over in our boardroom. I know that we're not there tonight, we usually are, but uh, I wanted to thank you again for uh, that donation and those renovations of our beautiful boardroom. And also, I wanted to thank uh, Marion Monument Company and Derwin Marion for the granite nameplate for the new board members, myself and uh, Jonathan Shaw. So they donated those as well. Dr. Varia, I think you had something you wanted to say. I was the lucky one. I was so usually yeah, before board meeting, lots of patients call me. I say patients because a lot of my patients. Uh, this time, I have more emails, and most of the women except one father. And I was lucky. They all believe in vaccination, mask, safe distance. And I asked them to come board meeting. The one doctor from Highland, well, she was right here, but she had to go for C-section. So she just left. But what, you know, they all wanted the children to come in person in the school. And I really liked it also. Small children, one year, we did go without. And if we do this year, kids will not come next year. They never understand the school is important. And online, you know, seven, eight, nine years old, it just, I know I'm too old for that. And it's too difficult for me to learn also. But anyway, so I explained that, that we have a hybrid, virtual, and in person. And a lot of people apply for that. But there is a one explanation, I explained that, that once you become virtual, whole semester, you have to stay there because we keep special teachers for you, special staff, and we cannot change everything. So I asked them to come in a meeting, call our superintendent, her door are always open, and we can do that. But I was just lucky. They all believe in safe precautions. So, and we will keep open, hybrid, virtual, and in person also, that we all discussing about that. Do we have other public comment? If not, we'll move on. 
Action of special report, student learning. I assume that we don't have anything. Action of special report, student support. Receive the report of the superintendent. Are there any questions or comments? I'll make a motion with I'm going to do A, B, A, B together. Just wait a minute. Okay. Receive the utility report for Stumbo Elementary School. Any questions or comments? If not, I entertain a motion for uh, four and five A and B. I'll make that motion. And Keith, Keith made the motion and Steve seconded. I'll do a roll call. Chandra Varia. William Newsom. Yes. Steve Sloan. Yes. Keith Smallwood. Yes. And Linda Gott Gearhart votes yes. The motion carries. Okay, receive the report for Ross Tarrant uh, Architects about roofing options for the bus garage. Do we have a representative? Could you not hear me? <laughs> Hi, um, very nice to meet you all and be here today. Um, it's good to meet everybody. And uh, I gave a report to Linda about the roof so that I know she shared with you. And I'm here to answer any questions you have about that. And um, I don't know where to start, so. <laughs> Pardon, could you repeat that please? Oh, sorry. Um, I gave a report on the roofs. Do you want me to go over the whole report, or do you have specific questions that you want to ask about this report? Uh, yeah, look. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? A little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. Most people don't want to hear me. Right. Um, looking through your report. Um, Looking at the difference between 6A and 6B, what would be your professional recommendation? Let me remember what the difference was for one second, please. It starts on page three. Hey, yep. I got louder. And uh, then page four. So, so the difference is the kind of insulation that you would put under the roof. The Skyliner roof insulation is a little bit of a higher end insulation. Um, the sagging bag is really what the typical insulation that you see under a metal roof, which is sagging bag is exactly what it sounds like, right? You string it over the stringers and you kind of see it from the bottom. Is, is that what we have presently? Yes, yes, that is what you presently have. Um, either one is a good roof system and it's going to give you a 20 year warranty on that roof system, but the insulation is just a little bit different. Discussion on the other end there, Junior or Dr. Darius? I would recommend 6A. That's yeah. better I insulation. I think we're in agreement. You want to make a motion? Dr. 
I make a motion we should accept 6A. I second that. Steve has made the motion that we go with 6A and Junior has seconded it. Let's, let's take a roll call. Keith Smallwood? Yes. Steve Sloan? Yes. Junior Newsom? Yes. Chandler Barrier? And the chair votes yes. The motion carries. All right, thank you. If you guys have any other questions about roofs, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I need for you to take a look at the consent items. Um, do we have any that we need to pull to discuss? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pull H, K, and O, E, F, and Q. Slow down. H. K and O, E, F, Q. Okay, E, S, let's see, H, K, and O have to do with the school trips. And although I'm not opposed to the school trips, I think that we need to put some restrictions on those. And that if there should be a travel ban, uh, the virus numbers go up. Uh, you know, regulations as to the, the virus is what I'm talking about. We don't want to send kids uh, to other states where there's surges or, you know, whatever. So I think that even though we may pass those school trips, I think everybody needs to know that we may also have to cancel those school trips. That was my concern. E, F, and Q have to do with front fundraisers outside the school. I think we had one more, but it was within the school. Um, on the, on, let's go back to the trips okay. for a second. Okay. If, if, if they do go on the trips and if they come back and it's mandated that they have to go into uh, Quarantine. Quarantine. Thank you. Um, will that be implemented? And that would mean a, a an actual quarantine that they're not going to be able to practice, and they will uh, they they will understand that. Is that correct? Yes, that is, uh, and I'll restate that the concerns that if these three trips are approved tonight, that if there is a ban by the governor that there's no out of state travel, of course they would not be traveling if they do tra travel on one of these trips and they need to quarantine when they return that that means these teams would not be practicing or playing at any level okay. 
Will there be will there be a school bus or will they transport themselves or how will that work? I know with the trip, uh, the Myrtle Beach trip, it's a little bit off. That is what a December trip. No, that is um, March, and there's a Las Vegas One, trip. But the September 10th trip, the September 10th trip uh, to Tennessee. Then, uh, I, I do believe that um, the principal at Prestonsburg High School is planning to use the waiver for parents to transport their own children on that trip as we currently speak to um, cut down on the transportation on public transport and possibly mixing the kids and spreading the virus. So I guess what we're saying is if we vote for these tonight, it will be under condition. Okay, let's move. I want to look at E, F, and Q having to do with fundraisers. Three out of four had to do with outside the school fundraisers. And again, if we vote for these tonight, I think that parents need to be very cautious about where they allow their children to go and uh, wear their mask and, and observe conditions that need to be observed in uh, dealing with the public. So I, I'm not opposed to the fundraisers at all, but I think there needs to be some caution. And there should always be caution when kids are out doing anything like this. Are there any other comments? Okay, Dr. Varia, you want to make a comment about X, which is consider approved to place the existing girls softball scoreboard located at Betsy Lane High School into surplus. You want to make a comment about that? I want some more information about that. Say it again. Say it a little bit louder. I'd like to have more information about that. More information about that. Okay. Otherwise, we can table and discuss. May I get more information and we can pick the next board meeting. Joe Marson, do you have any additional information on the X that was considered or approved to place the existing girls softball scoreboard located at Betsy Lane High School into surplus? We're having a real hard time hearing. Okay, Dr. Chandler's just asking if you have any additional information on that scoreboard that's being surplused for Betsy Lane that they're recommending. We can't hear you. Okay, he says no knowledge. No knowledge. <coughs> okay. Is this, I'm looking, I'm trying to open it up, I think this is the girls softball score, scoreboard that they're proposing to surplus and donate to David School. Uh, they, they are getting a new scoreboard, I do know that, and the existing scoreboard, we may have to pay somebody to take it away. The, uh, because it's not very good at all. The issue paper says, uh, with district and community sponsorship, Betsy Lane High School will be purchasing a new scoreboard for girls softball. Okay. There's okay. no explanation okay. of where it's going to go uh, to or anything like that. There is a, if you read the information we have, uh, they say the cost will be shared by community in the district. Usually we never share, the district never share the cost because there are a lot of schools need that. And if district support that, 
the board member has to pass them. Well, I don't think district can do, department can do $10,750 without board approval. So if we don't, if we don't have any information yet. So they're proposing to surplus and donate it to David's school. District going to pay $10,750. And, 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 and district pay to get it, so what fund is coming? And then it has to come to the board before we pass it. Right, Linda? We don't have any attorney. Do you think we can? This is saying the budgetary impact is nothing, that there's none on this. Uh, Mr. Rose, do you have any additional information on it either? Okay. Okay, yeah, because it's saying budgetary impact to the district is none. Uh, they, they're getting this donated, so it's no cost to the board at all. No, okay. no, no, $10,750 district going to pay is not free. Because I inquired here, do you want me to give information? Okay, let's just, let's just table that until we can get more information. Okay, the next we have is AFF concerning consider approved bank security bid for school access control systems. Do we have a representative? Yes. Good evening, I'm John Hunt, and this is Jason King. I'm your Chief Safety Officer, and Jason King works in our technology department. He is our security tech lead. Uh, we're here to answer any questions you may have. It says, it says here that, what, what, what's the RBH access, what, what, what does that mean? I'm sorry, can you speak R up, please? RB, RBH access, I see that. Is that a brand? Or? Uh, yes, that's the brand name of the access control system that we currently have that we're expanding upon. Is, uh, is that what the state recommends, or is that what the company put forward? Uh, it's, uh, it's not really a recommendation on brand, only that we're trying to maintain a, uh, a constant brand name throughout the system so we have compatibility. Because we already purchased, uh, already purchased access for a few schools, so we're just sticking with the same brand so that we have the same management system behind it. So I can get this straight. Does, does, this, does this include actual access control, which is the button, your face comes up, or is this just the card reader? Uh, can you repeat that, please? We can't hear you. Can you repeat yeah. that, please? I cannot hear you. Yeah, well, we can't hear you. The, uh, the existing, for instance, Adams Middle School, I'll just use them. They have an access control point. You push a button, they can release the doors. Does this, does this include that, or is this just card readers? This particular project is just the card reader and the door sensors for each so exterior this does door. Not, so this does not include the push button? No, all, all of our schools are in exactly. compliance with that. Exactly. So we, we're just needing card readers? Yes. Our three, our three high schools currently have the card swap access control system. 
we are expanding this, utilizing the funds that have been allocated to us. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we've given you a breakdown with each of the schools, so that's our nine remaining schools that do not have the system. And, 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 and the ones, except Floyd Central, if I'm correct, are all RBH? Uh, two. That's correct, yes. Only two but RBH. you said card readers only. Uh, on our existing schools, every one of them has a push button at the front door, and that's all they have. Right, right. So we're talking about, you know, complete lock hardware, everything, wire pulls, the, the whole exactly. night. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. And the spirit of this, in accordance with the school safety law, is that we are reducing the amount of key core locks in our campuses. So we're going to reduce those down to a strategic number. Uh, that's something we can share. I'm not comfortable saying in a public forum here what we are doing from a safety standpoint, but we can address that individually with each one of you. Exactly. Uh, but the spirit of it is to reduce those so we can eliminate uh, almost all of our old keys that are circulating out there. And then we can control our doors with a card swap system that can be exactly. programmed you, digitally. You, yeah, you'll know who went in and out, et cetera. Yeah, I, exactly. And we know the time they enter and exit, right, with that system? I'm sorry, Ms. Shepard. We know the time that they entered and exited our buildings with that card system? Yes, we will be able to monitor who enters our schools, at what location, what door they entered, what time. And you can program the cards to restrict access, for instance, from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. Uh, you can restrict the access that our coaches have to our schools. You can designate what door they have access to. Um, the, the, the capabilities are endless when you want to talk about how much you want to restrict who has access to your schools. And the, the, system, the system generates reports. So if you have, uh, say, you request a report for an employee's comings and goings over a specified amount of time, you can give that to me and in seconds I can give you you know, a month, three months, or a year report on that employee. So, you, so, so this is, if I'm looking at this correctly, it's, it's, it's up to four doors at each school, or is, could it be more than that? I may have seen something in there that one said nine. Yes, the, the, in short, what we recommended to each one of our principals before we went out and consulted with them, uh, Mr. King and I sat down kind of assessed with what we thought would be strategic locations. And then each school was applied with that formula. Um, now each school has almost the same number, I believe. South Floyd may have one less than what is the common theme throughout the district. And RLC has considerable less, but those were based on the size of the campus and the, the actual layout of the campus. Uh, and what we, aside from addressing our front entrance and our food service entrance and our one gymnasium door, we then moved throughout the campus and strategically placed those in accordance with what, because most of these are elementary schools uh, with the exception of uh, Adams Middle School. So we looked at what were going to be strategic locations for, for instance, a reverse evacuation in the event that we were on one of our playgrounds or given the current climate we're in right now, we could be outside on a mass break. So we wanted to provide strategic locations that we could safely and quickly get back into school if needed. questions or comments we have a request to table that I'll make that motion I'll second it thank you both for all the information it's very yeah, helpful thank you guys thanks a lot thank you there's been a motion to table that uh, Steve made the motion Keith seconded it do I have any more discussion or questions if not 
Chandravaria, yes. No, yes. Junior Newsom. Junior? We're, vo we're voting on that, uh, to table that. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, all right. Steve? Yes. Key? Yes. And, and chair votes yes, motion carried. Okay, I also want to pull E.E. E. Consider approve the Floyd County School District return to school plan. And after our uh, public comments, I think that uh, Ms. Shepard would entertain any questions from the board about that. So we can make sure we're clear on the regulations from the Department of Education. Are there any questions about the return to school plan? Is that is, is the mass thing she was mentioning, is it mandated or is it a recommendation? No, we have a Kentucky School Board emergency regulation for masking for 270 days, and that is still in place. The governor's mask mandate of 30 days, I do believe, was rescinded today, but we still have the Kentucky School Board uh, emergency regulation to, for masking for 270 days. Is Annette what? here? Annette, do we know what are the the regulations about a waiver if a child cannot wear a mask because of a condition? Is there, are there certain conditions? Come on down, Annette, if you would, because it's so hard to hear. I understand that a two-year-old would have a terrible time or a three-year-old would have a terrible time wearing a mask. And uh, Although I will, if I can comment, uh, Madam Chair, and as you know, I just stepped away from being early childhood director for 11 years. And last year we had students that were able to wear masks and wore masks on buses of those ages of three and four. We do not currently have two-year-olds enrolled, but uh, that is possible based on my past experience last year with those children. Lots of times children conform better than the older kids do. Um, the regulation states that if a child has a disability or it would be detrimental to their medical condition to wear a mask, that a mask can be waived. So, they wouldn't have to wear a mask. And that, that would be obtained from a doctor? Or yes. yes. Okay. And usually the, the doctors don't have any problem writing that for children that have disabilities, you know, especially speech and hearing impaired. But we do have, uh, we bought last year, we bought masks that are clear in the middle so that students can see the teacher's mouth move, the teacher can see theirs if they're able to wear that type of mask, but if they're not, if they're hearing or speech impaired, um, or they have respiratory difficulty or a medical condition that would prevent that, then we would be able to obtain those waivers and they wouldn't have to wear a mask. Okay, so what I'm hearing, it is possible to get a waiver from the doctor, yes. and, it, and if it is, if, if a child's having trouble with speech or some type of development, Yes. Uh, they may be able, more than likely to get the waiver. Yes. You, we also have clear masks. Yes, we do. So that uh, the child can see or the teacher speaking. Te yeah, the teacher speaking. Yes. Yeah. So we that's purchased not those blocked. last year. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, uh, since last year, there's been a, you know, there's a lot of new masks that have been designed and developed so we can purchase more um, anytime those type of students but um, you know we try to accommodate any medical condition or anything that would would cause a mask to be detrimental to a student um, and that also goes for our staff um, if we have a staff person that is uh, that has a disability that the doctor would write a statement saying that it would be detrimental to their medical condition then they would also be waived from wearing masks and if I can add that we do currently have 
a mask uh, mandate for public transportation, which includes our buses, by the U.S. Department of Transportation. So we do have that in effect. In effect, we've had that in effect. I think since maybe June or the beginning of July, but that is still in effect. So if they boarded a bus, they would have to have the mask. Yes. yes, unless they have a medical condition that would prevent them from wearing one, and we have a waiver in place. Um, you know, if we can use our special needs buses and things for children that, you know, do not, they can't wear a mask, then that would be better than putting them in with the general population on the bus. But if we do have to put them into the general population on the bus, then we would seat them so that they are safe in the front or Wow. in a position where they're not in the back of the bus or in the middle of the bus. He should have had you speak earlier, I think. <laughs> I <And> wanted to. <laughs> I, I wish I'd called on you. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, in, in listening uh, to a lot of parents, I think there's just a lot of misunderstanding wow. as to what we're able to provide. Okay. Um, you know, I, I wanted to tell that mother that was crying. I mean, she broke my heart. That I wanted did. to tell her that we, all we would need, you know, was a waiver and we would make provisions for her child to, to come to Head Start. I would never right. want a child not to be able to come right. to school. Okay. I also, knowing uh, how schools and classrooms functioned last year during the pandemic and the outstanding jobs that they all did, uh, there were mask breaks. I mean, I happened to have my office last year inside a school and mask breaks are taken as needed. And I think we saw more probably mask breaks of the younger kids, but the early childhood students, of course, none of our students wear masks when eating. They don't wear masks when they are uh, taking a, a nap or on their cots. And everybody has built in mask breaks for their students. When they go to the restroom, for instance, in early childhood, they, that's a mask break for them. They're in the bathroom by themselves, you know, inside the classroom. So uh, I felt like there was, you know, adequate mask breaks scheduled in the daily schedule for all grade levels. Uh, Annette, I do have one question. Um, on the second page of it, it's the second page. It's on the on the last page that you gave us. It says fully vaccinated people who have come into close contact with someone with COVID-19 should be tested three to five days following the date of exposure and wear a mask in public indoor settings for 14 days or until they receive a negative test result. It's my understanding, um, I saw something from the CDC today, and that's, and that's the only reason that I'm asking this, okay. is that they recommended uh, that you, it was, given, it was given out by one of the health departments in one of the counties uh, in central Kentucky, and it was something from the CDC saying that they recommended that you wait five days that you could get a, a, a false negative at three to five. So should we, take the three to five out and put it at five days and go with what the CDC's latest thing is or, or what? Well, that's, Be a, because that's a common problem for us because the, the CDC and the Department of Public Health, it's like almost every other day they're updating and they're changing. Um, when I'm speaking to someone about testing, I recommend personally that they wait five to seven days because if they test on the third day, sometimes that's too early. And like you said, they'll have a negative test, and then on the fifth to seventh day, they'll test positive. Uh, but we are also looking at, um, and I wanted to, to tell the parents that too tonight, that uh, we're also looking at being able to do our own testing. Um, we will, right now, um, it's very feasible for us to do symptomatic testing uh, in our schools. Uh, the uh, Big Sandy Healthcare nurse practitioners and the nurse that we have, there's three locations, they've always been able to do COVID testing since uh, they started testing. So they were doing COVID testing last year. Um, so we have, um, Ann and I have looked at um, some information that we were sent by our drug testing company that we already are in a contractual agreement with to provide 
uh, our testing. They would train our health services staff and we would be able to do our own testing. And what would, would those be rapid tests or? They'd be rapid tests. And not, they won't be the, I call them the scrubber test because if you've ever had one, that's what they feel like. Uh, it will not be the one that goes down your nose with the, the brush on the end. It will be yeah. the, the swab, the nasal swab. Well, you know, I, I'm just going to use my family for example. My daughter tested positive on December the 26th. I tested positive on January the 1st. Yeah. Um, my wife and my youngest son tested positive on the 6th. Uh, and, and yet she was negative. On the third, that, that's why I'm saying I. I don't think it would be. A I'm not real satisfied with the with the three to five day. I mean, I I, I understand why why it's in there. It's just. Uh, well, the I, CDC, like you said, they just you know just in the last couple of days they've changed it, um, and you know we're seeing a lot of changes. So I don't think it would be a problem for us to change that into to our plan to follow the CDC guidelines. Well, is this going to be a fluid doc document or is it going to be black and white? I think we're going to have to be flexible and be able to move back to be and very forth uh, depending on, you know, what the numbers are. Um, you know, and we're under the, the guidance of the Floyd County Health Department also. Um, and a lot of decisions are made based upon what our numbers are um, in our county because our county may be different than Pike County or Johnson County or Martin County. You know, we're seeing a little fluctuation in numbers, but it looks like the counties around us are, are catching up to our numbers in the last couple of days. And we are seeing clusters. Um, as I've been doing contact tracing and working on our, uh, our information and data we get from the health department, we're seeing a lot of family clusters. Uh, we have one child in the family and there's four more. All four of those other children have COVID too within so many days. Mm -hmm. It seems like if you're in a household with someone that has COVID, you're very lucky if you don't get it also with this barrier. So I'd like to encourage any parent that has concerns to call you yes. at the Board of Education. Yes. Because, I, you know, I just think there's just, there's a lot of misinformation. And, you know, part of that is the fluctuation with CDC, Department of Public Health, uh, and all these guidelines that come out, I mean, that's one of the first things I do every day is to pull the guidelines up and look at them to see what are we doing today or what are we going to be doing tomorrow because they change right. a lot right. depending on what, what the situation right. is. That's true. But they can always call me, um, you know, and to the best of my ability, I will explain um, if someone could get that mother to call me um, from the Head Start program, I would love to talk to her because I would like to see her before we go ahead and start. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, uh, Mr. Smallwood, you mentioned about it being a um, living document or a fluid plan that it has been that. And as we uh, move forward, it will need to be so that we can reflect all the changes as they come about. And they're coming at us pretty quickly like with right. various changes. Well, what, what, I mean, looking uh, at it from the three to five, my concern is if Steve got it, and then at three days, me and Linda went and took the test and said, hey, we're negative. Uh, and then we go out and we honeybee and decide that we're going to go to a family reunion and uh, to a couple ball games or whatever, thinking that we're safe. So that's my only concern with it. And that's why I'm saying after seeing what, uh, and it was shared by a friend of mine that's a, that, that is a nurse. Uh, I think it might have been Madison County Health, the health Department to share it. And anyway, they said the latest things were that they were recommending to wait five days. And, uh, and see, so. that's different. You know, when they first came out, they recommended three to five. Uh, yeah. And now they've, now they've changed. But, you know, um, like Anna said, you know, that's going to have to be a living document that, you know, we can change based upon new guidelines and new recommendations. And I'm updating Anna every day with emails and, and messages on, on the news information that I get. Also, uh, Cinda Francis, do you have any other things you want to come down and say to be sure that we're clear um, around 
special education students. Thank you, Nan. concerning um, students returning with disabilities that may not be able to wear a mask. And the guidance that she gave me was that we're bound by federal law to allow students to attend school that have disabilities and that there may be times that doctors will not sign off saying that that student doesn't have to wear a mask. However, if it's agreed upon during an ARC meeting and we sign off on it, you know, which would become legally binding, um, those students only have to have that listed as an accommodation inside their IEP. And then it will be our responsibility as educators to have mitigating measures in their IEP, such as verbal and physical prompts to help that student learn to wear that mask. Does that make sense? Okay. But, um, it would be very difficult to find, as she said, uh, physicians that would be willing to sign a waiver saying that they don't have to wear the mask. But at the same time, we can't deny them a free and appropriate public education because that's federal law. I misunderstood. I thought Annette said that they probably would sign a waiver. Is it? We haven't, uh, I know last year whenever uh, school returned, we did have about six students in the district. Um, these are students with more severe uh, disabilities that were unable to wear a mask and we had no physicians that would sign the mask waiver at that point. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions as to whether we Okay. About the mask, you know, I always wear mask. We doctor surgery, we have to wear mask. Uh, I have four grandchildren. They are like three to five years old. They love the mask. It's new toy for them. And they go to, you know, they go kindergarten and preschool. They all wear in the mask. It's no problem. I think we sometimes we parents have a problem. The kids may not have a problem. I think it's individual circumstances, and I think if a parent feels like their child has a problem, they need to contact the school and the appropriate personnel and find out if anything can be done. See, here's an idea with that. What if the parent doesn't feel the child has a they should have a choice. That's just the way I, the way I look at it. You know, that's just the way I feel. It should be up to the parent, not the government. And my recommendation, again, is that we follow the Kentucky School Board's emergency regulation for masking at this time. Well, maybe we ought to do a separate vote on that. That is, what was that? Mm -hmm. Consider approved the Floyd County School District return to work plan. I need a motion to accept Ms. Shepard's recommendation that we follow the, the okay, yes, the Kentucky School Board uh, 
emergency regulation. And uh, I need a motion. Do I have a motion? <laughs> Dr. Chandra made the motion. Do I have a second? The chair seconds. I will take a vote. Chandra Varia. Yes. William Newsom. Yes. Steve Sloan. I'll abstain. Keith Smallwood. I'll abstain as well. And the chair votes yes. The motion carries. Now, at, a late, at another date, Ms. Shepard, is there a possibility that we might be able, if we have more information, that we might be able to develop our own plan if we have the liberty to do that? Yes, with this regulation, you know, we're, we're agreeing to follow the regulation. If that changes, we may be at a different place. You know, if there's changes to that, just like there was with the governor's uh, rescinding today. But as we stand today, it is a uh, emergency regula uh, regulation by the Kentucky School Board that. Uh, okay. So I think, as we know, there's a lot of, of moving parts and a lot of fluidness to all of this, both in what our plan. Uh, includes and how it's a living plan as we know moving forward most all of this is okay we had a motion to uh, table X and FF so I need a motion from uh, for A through GG except for X and F F which are table. Do I have a motion? Yeah, I'll make that motion. Keith made the motion. Do I have a second? Dr. Varia a second. I will do a roll call on that. Keith Smallwood? Yeah. Steve Slong? Yeah. William Newsom? Yes. Chandra Varia? Yeah. And the chair votes yes. The motion carries. Do we have a need for executive session? Okay, we have no need for executive session. I have need a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Steve made the motion. Second. Second by Keith. Anybody opposed? We stand adjourned.